I'm here with uh, Omar Ismail and Jimmy Mullah, uh, two of my dearest, closest friends uh, from Sudan. Uh, and uh, Jimmy Mullah is the uh, director of a Sudanese-led, U.S.-based coalition uh, of groups that are working for a holistic approach to peace in Sudan. Uh, it's called Voices for Sudan, and Omar Ismail works with us here at the Enough Project, um, and he is a senior uh, policy advisor. Now, we were just talking about the last time we three were together, and it happened to be March 30th. We walked out of the west wing of the White House uh, down that little driveway, totally elated, because we had just met with President Obama and he spelled out a vision of where U.S. policy ought to go that was utterly inspiring. And he rolled out his new special envoy for Sudan, a guy called General Scott Gratian. That was the high point. We have been on a rope downhill since then uh, because of, principally because we have seen the evolution of U.S. policy heading in directions that are very disturbing to us. And so we thought we would get together today to talk about what specifically is going on with U.S. policy and what specifically is going on on the ground in Sudan to understand better uh, what needs to be done and what you, the viewers, can do to help get this ship back on the right course so we can see, uh, as soon as possible, peace come to our beloved country of Sudan. So we want to start first, Jimmy, with uh, you and to talk just a little bit about what is happening now on the ground in southern Sudan and uh, what is relevant to U.S. policy as the Obama administration finalizes its deliberations about what its policy is going to be to Sudan. The South, you know, you, it's under the schedule in, in terms of implementing the comprehensive peace agreement. And uh, the agreement has not really been going on smoothly. Um, and, and then you find that uh, the timelines are not being met. And you have elections coming, you have a referendum. And so just to be able to meet those deadlines is becoming a huge, a huge problem. And so you just don't know how this would go through. So there's, there's need for a lot of, uh, a lot of U.S. Uh, engagement mm -hmm. in this process because in the first place, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was uh, the effort of the U.S. and the international community. And it was a huge success. Yes. So we're hoping by now we'll be seeing like the South or, and the whole of Sudan moving towards permanent peace. And in addition to the fact that particularly the National Congress Party, the ruling party in Sudan, is not implementing key provisions of the agreement. It also seems to me that the, an equally important and urgent dangerous uh, trend is we're seeing increased attacks, militia attacks, in the South, like we saw during the war, during the North-South War. And it seems to me that it's being funded primarily by the National Congress Party in advance of the referendum to undermine any possibility of unity in the South, of, of uh, peace in the South so that there won't be in a referendum. So they can say, you know, hey, we can't, uh, we can't do this. The Southerners, they're fighting again, so we better not have this referendum. What's your take on that? I mean, you're absolutely right, because like the key provisions of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement is what would kind of make the agreement succeed. And if you don't implement those key provisions, definitely you're working against, you undermine the agreement itself. And this has been the story with the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. And so you see all these kind of things coming up, like with the militias and the, the, the insecurity that is coming up. This has always been the, 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 what the, you know, some of the tools that the NCP mm -hmm. is using to undermine the CPA. And what's so interesting about that and, and disturbing is that the same strategy of using these ethnic-based militias to undermine the uh, peace and harmony in, in particular regions, the same strategy that they use with the Janjaweed in Darfur. What's going on these days now in Darfur? We're hearing all these stories that war is over, peace has broken out in, in Darfur from all these officials, obviously self-serving statements. What's going on in Darfur now? I think the, to, to begin with, uh, the uh, statements are irresponsible because the war is not over in Darfur. If there is insecurity to the extent that the, the uh, African Union troops themselves uh, are not are not secure in Darfur, and and we've seen in the in the last few weeks we had uh, some of the workers kidnapped, uh, the the aid workers in Darfur kidnapped, and before we can resolve that, some of some more workers were kidnapped mm -hmm. uh, in, in West Darfur in the, just the last few days. Uh, uh, war cannot end by talking about it like this and saying it ended. <laughs> war ended. War ends by practical measures that uh, like a comprehensive agreement that is going to stop the war. Or one of the 
factions or one of the combatants, and, uh, the, in this case, the Darfur rebels or the government of Sudan will have a decisive victory yeah. on, on, on the battlefield, and that never happened. Uh, war will end when we see three million uh, IDPs inside Darfur going back to their original places because they feel secure, because they feel that there, there, there is a chance for them to re restart their lives. That is not happening. Mm -hmm. So the war is going on as long as there is lack of security, and the war will go on as long as the two parties, the Darfur rebels and the government of Sudan, control the switch. They yep. can turn it on, they can turn it off right. at any time they want. So the, th that is the situation in Darfur today. On the other hand, we are trying, as Darfurians in the civil society, we are trying to get together to, to be able to uh, make our voices heard in the peace process. However, in the absence of that, the process that is going to lead us to an end state, mm -hmm. uh, we, we found ourselves uh, in, in the middle of nowhere. In fact, some of the efforts that we are doing today is like building a bridge to nowhere. Uh, th they are efforts that are commendable, they are good, However, without an end state, without a, a light that we can see at the end of the tunnel, all these efforts will fritter away and we will, will not have any peace agreement that, and, uh, you know, that is going to end the crisis, not just in Darfur, but will feed into the peace process in the south and elsewhere in, in the country where we are looking at a holistic approach to address the issues of, uh, of Sudan. So let's build on that. Yeah. And, uh, and, and talk just a little bit more about Darfur. So we, we talked about what, what's going on on the ground. It's not, uh, certainly is, uh, the war has not ended in Darfur as it's, uh, we're concerned that it's about to restart in, a, in earnest in the South. It seems to me that the, the NCP, the ruling party in Sudan, has been able to do this for quite some time. They can't fight a two-front war full on in both the South and Darfur. So when they, when they slow down their military activities, as we're seeing now in Darfur, they heat them up in the South. When they slow down their activities, sign agreements, whatever, in the South, they heat them up in Darfur. We've seen this pattern go back and forth. And those that come into this for a short time, like the outgoing UNAMID general, the UN general who said the war is over, doesn't understand that basic fact that these guys are already, you know, they're down there lighting matches and, on, and on starting fires in southern Sudan. So you were saying that in Darfur, uh, the policy that is being articulated by the United States, I think if I got you right, is that w there, there's a lot of work being done, right? There's a lot of energy and activity but there, there isn't, there's no kind of end game. There's no vision of what the peace deal would actually look like. In the absence of that, then it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, as you you're said. You're spinning our wheels. Yeah, you're spinning the, the wheels like a gerbil, a hamster on that, on that wheel. Why don't you elaborate a little more on, on what the problem is with U.S. policy in Darfur today, so then later we'll get to the solution. The fundamental pr problem with the policy is that today there is no policy. <laughs> that, is, that is to begin with. However, the, 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 the attempts to move the sticks in Darfur are not going to be fruitful because we have uh, seen this before. We had Elias and, and, and Salim as the, as the mediators mm -hmm. coming from the United Nations and the, and, and, and the EU. And, and they were going around talking to everybody who is willing to listen without telling them what they want to do at yeah, the end, yeah. without bringing in a piece of paper that will uh, outline one, two, three, this is what we want to do in case we have a peace agreement, and to shop it around and to see who will agree with that, who will not agree with it, how to tweak it a little bit, how to uh, fix it, and, and we see the points, uh, the points that people agree on and the, uh, where they disagree so that we can have a clear path to peace and what kind of expectations that we yeah. are having when we sit around the table. The United States is supposed to be ahead of that. Yes. The United States is supposed to lead an international coalition. That uh, The same thing that we have done in the South before. The United States plus the European Troika plus EGAD, and we managed to, to, make, to, the peace. to, to make peace in, yeah. in, in Sudan with the pressure on the government of Sudan continuing yes. so that they can come and, and negotiate peace in good right, faith. Right. This is not happening in the case of Darfur. Yeah. And, and in the absence of that, we drop Darfur and now we say, oh, the, the South has a, a problem, the problem, and let us save the South. By, by not working on multi-tracks, yes. by not being able to chew gum and walk at the same time, we are just going to do the same jumping from one place to another, and, and the government of Sudan is the happiest in the yeah. middle. And I just want to go to that point. You know, um, We go back to 2005 when the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed. And at that point, there was the expectation that we have peace in the south. Mm -hmm. Now we are going to use that model of the CPA to have peace in Darfur. But 
what happened was that we saw an escalation of violence or the government stepping up its military campaign. So this kind of proves that the resources that they were using to fight the war in the South yes. were now directed to fight the war in Darfur. And one last point I would like to make about uh, Darfur is that in our trips together, Omer, you know, we've gone at least five, six times now uh, together and separately a few times, you more than me, uh, into Darfur and into the refugee camps as well in Chad. It is utterly obvious when you speak to the people who have been displaced by the violence, what the core issues are. So it is utterly mystifying to me that after three or four years of this endless hamster on a, on a, on a wheel diplomacy, that we can't come up, as you say, with a set of specific, just like they did in the South in 2005, a set of specific uh, uh, core uh, proposals that can then get everyone on board and we can come to a solution. That's the way you do a peace process. What is the problem? Every man, woman, and child in Darfur today, all seven million of them, being inside Darfur in the refugee camps, being in the garrison towns, or in diaspora like myself and others, we all understand what needs to be done when we sit around the table. The demands of the people of Darfur were articulated enough for anybody to listen. Yeah. All we need to do is to put that on paper. That is not going to resolve the issue. But when we put it on paper and we go around and say, Abdel Wahid, what do you agree with this? And don't you, don't you agree with this? Seven points. He will agree with two, three. He will have concerns about two, three. Then you he negotiate. Will disagree with three. And then you we negotiate. negotiate. We exactly. take the same paper to Khalil. Yes. We take the same paper to the civil society. We take the same paper to the other SLA groups. Yeah. We try to unify these people around certain positions. Yes that we, we are going to negotiate. Right. The physical unification of the, of the groups is not going to happen for all obvious reasons. We have to unify them on a platform. Yep. We have to pl unify them on negotiating position that is going to be acceptable for everybody. And we say, this is the venue. Let us sit here. Yep. Let us do it. By that time, also, the government of Sudan will understand what they are expecting on the, on the negotiations. We have a, a, a declaration of principles that we signed in Abuja. It is very good. We can enlarge that. We can say, uh, these are the principles that you agreed on. And, and the, the good thing about that declaration of principle, all parties at the time who are n still the same parties mm -hmm. signed on that declaration mm -hmm. of so principle. Why don't we um, start take from there. that and, and start yeah. from there? Mm -hmm. so, so in contrast to Darfur, as we've said, in the South, there was that kind of a process. Yeah. The U.S. did take that leadership in 2003, 2004, and it resulted in the agreement in 2005, the North-South Peace Agreement, the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. But now, that agreement's at risk. And I'm, I'm wondering, Jimmy, if you can explain what your view is of what the problem is with the U.S. policy with respect to that agreement and why we're not contributing to the solution, but we're actually part of the problem right now. Yeah, actually, once the Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed, there was a lot of uh, U.S. involvement in making sure this agreement moved forward. But I guess with the, with the issue erupting in Darfur and all other things, there was no focus in terms of following the implementation through. So you find so many key provisions of the agreement were not being implemented. And the U.S. being the major, uh, uh, the major facilitator in the process was not playing a much more active role. And that's why you find so many things not going according to what we expected. And we are actually at this point because there's no, uh, no focus and no, no, uh, no constant engagement to mm -hmm. make sure that what we signed, what we worked for to get on paper, and what which, which is really a, a good agreement, you know, and that was really a big step, and we did not follow through. Yeah. And I think that that's the, that's the major problem. We need a holistic approach. We need a look at all the issues of Sudan, spearheaded by the United States, creating this international coalition with everybody concerned. The European Troika in place, the Chinese will be brought in, the regional powers that are in, uh, like, uh, like Egypt, and, 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 and we go to Doha, create an environment whereby we have a peace agreement in Darfur. We make sure that this peace agreement is going to take place before the coming elections so that the Darfurian people, as well as their country, uh, fellow countrymen and, and women in the rest of the country, will participate in a fair, and free election that is going to really represent the aspirations and the hopes of the people of Sudan, then at that time we would say, with the com implementation of the uh, Comparative Peace Agreement in the South, that we have a, a way clear for us for a, a just referendum, a fair representation of the people of the South. If they opt for unity, they will be with their brothers and sisters like the, the way we used 
to be uh, f from the beginning of time, or we will be good neighbors and we will negotiate also how to separate these countries because uh, separating them is not going to be easy. It's not going to, to happen by the end of the referendum or by uh, uh, you know uh, the results of the referendum coming out. And it's not too late because the other forces need to be led by the United States government. And we need to see the Obama administration step up now in, on behalf of the people of the South, on behalf of the people of Darfur, on behalf of the entire Sudanese uh, nation to press and push with everything we got for peace. And it seems to me from what we talked about in Darfur, the U.S. needs to in, in, immerse itself in the details of creating that proposal that the Darfurian people can rally around and can lead to peace in Darfur at the same time with equal energy work assiduously for the implementation, the strict implementation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement and lead an international effort to create consequences for anyone who undermines that peace agreement, whether by fueling the militias and supporting war, return to war in Southern Sudan, or not implementing specific provisions. The Obama administration actually, in my view, and I think and we share it, can make a difference here, can be the critical game changer in between war and peace in Sudan. That's why people have to write, that's why people have to call, that's why people have to email their representatives, their senators, the White House, and let them know when, when are you going to stand up? Where is Secretary Clinton? Where is Vice President Biden? Where are you, President Obama? When you guys were candidates, you were talking tough, you were saying all these kinds of things that you wanted to do, where are you now? That's our role, that's our job now. It is the moment because the United States government is making its decision about what its policy is going to be. And citizens all across this country, if we weigh in and say we want the strongest possible policy, backed by principle, we can get it. It's in our hands. Thanks very much. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.